we will, we're going to be talking about how we can be led by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. That will be our, ser our series text, be Proverbs 20, 27. The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Uh, Romans 8, 14 through 16. Let's look at the, the Spirit of man is God's lamp, is the lamp of the Lord. Romans 8, 14 through 16 says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And again, Proverbs 20, 27, The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. This verse means that God will enlighten us through our spirits. Not, neither our bodies or our minds are the candle of the Lord. The human spirit is the candle of the Lord. That's where God communicates with us, communicates with us in our spirit, and uh, not in our bodies, not in our minds. In the Old Testament, now, uh, God did some things, in the, well, most things were done with natural. They were unregenerated people. They, they were in covenant, but they weren't born again. And so it would take um, floods or lightnings or flies to get their attention. And he, he didn't really communicate with them. He just kind of corralled them <laughs> through their flesh. But the human, the, the born-again man, the born-again woman, is led by the Spirit of God in their inner man. Praise the Lord. Again, uh, our bodies or our minds are not the candle of the Lord. Man is a triune being. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and some of be here, supposed to be here already, but they're not here yet for the little guys. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah he's, he's right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're supposed to be here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, this is a tri man is a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy w-h-o-l-l-y and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ so uh, we have the spirit the soul and the body these these are uh, entities of man that are distinct and separate man is a spirit possesses a soul lives in a body the body and the soul can be separated it's obvious they can be separated because at the death the soul stays intact with the spirit and is separated from the body. The spirit and the soul can be divided asunder. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that. So <clears throat> let's look at the fact that man is an eternal being. Uh, Genesis 1.26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over, every, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And like one preacher said one time, thank God we got authority over creeps. Hallelujah. And so God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God created man in his image and likeness. And God is an eternal being, John 4, 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God created man in his class of being. God created man as a eternal spirit or a, uh, you know, when, when, once he was created, there would be no end to his existence as a spirit. Hallelujah. He, because God is a spirit and God, man was created in his image and his likeness after his kind, the man was created as a spirit that would exist forever. Um, once again, we, we really did not part of what I was teaching tonight, but the words death in the Bible do not mean cessation of existence. It, it really, if you understand them in the context they're used, it's separation. The human, the physical death is separation of the human spirit from the physical body. Uh, that way the, the, there, there is death. The body can't function without the spirit. Spiritual death is not the, the lack of existence of the spirit. It is the separation of the spirit from the, the uh, from God, who is life. So not when you are separated from him, who is life, then you are spiritually dead. You do, it's, it's not lack of existence. You are absent of the nature and qualities of God. Okay, You are spiritually dead or separated. Um, 
Philippians 1, 23 and 24. You know, let's listen to Paul here in reference to the fact that his spirit continues to exist. For I am at a strait between two, having a desire to, to, bar, to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, Paul is going to live in or out of the body. He is still going to live. Now, who did Paul say he would, would depart? He said, I would. Not his body, but the man on the inside. Paul referred to his human spirit as I, the real him. See, now, as, as the, uh, the Bible says this, that the body without the spirit is dead. The body without the spirit is dead. The body can't function without a human spirit. Um, <clears throat> but the spirit does continue. The spirit can func or, and does function without a body, but it can't function in this realm. You have to have a physical body to function in the natural realm. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward man never wears out. Why? Because he is renewed day by day. And the inward man exists forever. Once there is a human spirit procreated, there will be no end to the existence of that human spirit. Now, it will either exist with God in heaven through eternity or in, in hell with Satan through eternity. All based on whether or not you accept Jesus Christ as Lord. And then, let's look at one of the most famous scriptures ever written in the Bible. We all use this. Uh, well, this passage, this, down to this passage of scripture, the third chapter of John. We won't get to verse 16, but we're still in the same ballpark. John 3, 3 through 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, remember Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, Master, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. <clears throat> and, um, and Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And all the mother said, uh, Dear God, I hope not. Hallelujah. That would not be, you know, eight-pound babies are bad enough. Grown, grown babies would be terrible, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Some people say, I can't believe you said that in church. Oh, come on. Jesus answered and said, okay. And then Jesus answered, get back again, says this. Really, really, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh his flesh, and he's obviously making the reference that being born of water was being born naturally. You know, a woman breaks water when she gives birth. And then, uh, mar and then that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. So the spirit of man is the part of man that receives eternal life from God at the new birth. It is man's spirit that has made a new creation, not his body or his mind, God, listen, here's something <clears throat> that a lot of people don't get. God is not going to do anything about our bodies or our minds. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, your spirit is born again. But you are left with the responsibility to do something with the mind and with the body. Okay? That always goes over real big. I mean, looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation or one translation says a new species of being that never existed before. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. Now, and then verse 18 starts out and says this, and all things are of God. And so we find out real quick that obviously it can't be talking, when it says all things, it's, it's, it's a limitation of, the, of what he's talking about. If a man be born, if a man be in Christ, he's a new creature, is in reference to the spirit being born again. All things about that human spirit are new. All things, old things concerning that spirit are passed away. And all things concerning that spirit are of God. But it's obvious you didn't get a new mind. And you didn't get a new body. Hello? Don't we wish we could? Come to faith and the church, get saved and lose 80 pounds. Hey, come to faith and the church, get saved, and your mind will be like Einstein's. Well, it doesn't work that way. Okay? Um, Peter talking about, uh, writing to the church's passage of Scripture in 1 Peter 3, 
If you look over there, a passage of Scripture that's often taken somewhat out of context. Um, verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also be without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives, or the lifestyle of their wives. In other words, women live a lifestyle. If you're saved, live a lifestyle that will it, it manifest the presence of God and by your testimony of life win your husbands. And while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning and planting of hair and the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Now, people have made some stuff out of that. Women can't cut their hair and they can't wear, they can't, um, um, wear fancy clothes. Well, actually, if you take that thing to the whole, uh, or, or wear jewelry, but it says, or of putting on of apparel. If you take it the way a lot of people preach it or teach it or believe it, they can't do anything with their hair and they can't wear any jewelry, then they better go ahead and take the scripture all the way to the full end and, just stop, and start running around naked. Because it says putting on of apparel in the same context. So <clears throat> obviously it doesn't mean for us to run around naked. It doesn't mean that women can't ever wear jewelry. It says who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting a hair, wearing of gold, or putting on a pair. In other words, be modest. People take things to extremes. you got to understand, you know, understand the whole context here. But let it be that hidden, I like, this is what we're really after right here. But let it be that hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, what we were after here was just part, the part where he talks about the hidden man of the heart. Paul, even in talking about how women should adorn themselves and, and, and conduct themselves, and again, it's not talking about you can't ever cut your hair and you can't ever wear any jewelry or anything. Dad Hagen said one time he was in a meeting and, the, and this woman had come down to the altar and got baptized in the Holy Ghost and prayed for, for some time in other tongues and had just gone back to seat and one of the deacons came in late. And he came down there and sat beside her Looked at her and said, Sister, if you'll take off that jewelry, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Too late! He done filled her with the Holy Ghost jewelry and all. You just happened to be late and missed it. So if you've been on time, you'd have known that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so biblically speaking, the heart and the spirit are the same when in reference to man. In biblical talk, when the Bible's talking about the heart of man, uh, I mean, we can, you can have a reference that's actually talking about the physical heart, but the majority of it was talking in reference to man's heart. Uh, is really referring to man's spirit. So the heart of man, the spirit of man are made in reference one to the other, typically throughout the scripture. So the heart of man, the spirit of man are the same. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Now, what are we to do? We are to become spirit conscious and not body conscious. If you're going to be led by the spirit of God, you must become spirit conscious. <clears throat> um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, we've already read this, but it, we'll reread it for this particular point. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, that is pneuma in the Greek, and soul, suke in the Greek, and body, soma in the Greek, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, notice that the spirit's listed first because that is the real man. You can say it this way, I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. Everybody say glory. I live in a body. <clears throat> From the scriptures we've read, we, we understand Paul had become so spirit conscious that he said, uh, that he even made one reference to one place that, um, and making reference to, his, to who he is, he, ca he, called his, he said of his spirit, I. He made reference to himself as spirit man, um, in Philippians 1, 23 and 4, he said, I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to depart be with Christ, which is far better. Um, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more neat. To abide, let's say he says that, to abide in the flesh. I am in a strait. Who's in a strait? His spirit. He said to abide in the flesh was more needful. Okay? So the spirit of man is the real man. The body is your health. Health, health. Get sick talking so much King James, you can't you want to say on everything. All right? The house we live in, being spirit conscious will allow us, uh, uh, will help our faith because faith is of the spirit and, and, or of the heart and not of the mind or the flesh. You can have faith in your heart and doubt in your head. Okay? 
Um, so the difference between these is, um, found Dan Hagen said this, you know, uh, one time he said he helped him out understanding. He said, with my spirit, I contact the spirit realm. With my body, I contact the physical realm. With my soul, I contact the intellectual realm. Okay? But we know that, and I see a lot of people say, well, I, uh, uh, one, per one preacher told Dan Hagen a number of years ago, because he said, you know, um, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? They said, I, I thought they were the same thing. Well, that would make, make Hebrews 4.12 mess you up. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. If they're the same, they can't be divided asunder. Okay? And of the joints of marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, the spirit of man is who you are. It's how you contact the spirit realm. God's a spirit. It's like how God's going to contact you through your spirit. Okay? Not going to contact you through your body. Talk, you know, some people think because they got a goosebump. Oh, God's here. I've been in rooms and devils have showed up and I got goosebumps. It didn't mean that God was there. And the devil showed up. All right? We charismatic word of faith people, uh, we put a lot of weight, a lot of weight, and shouldn't, but we put a lot of weight as to whether God is around or God's manifesting or God is present, what's taking place is God, by feelings we get. Oh, I know it was good. We, you know, and, I, and I like the song. You know, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. You know? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can hear. You say, I forget. I can't even think of how it goes. His mighty grace. Um, I, hear the, I feel the touch of angels' wings. I say, yeah, I feel the touch. Of, now, I'm going to be honest with you. You probably didn't feel the touch of angels' wings. Or see glory on any. And you may have seen some glory on people's faces. <clears throat> but we, you know, we put so much weight. Oh, I felt. So, ooh, I got it. Ooh, I feel it. That don't mean anything. We, we, can, we can get feelings just because we get excited. I'll tell you, have you, ever, have you ever gotten goosebumps watching a patriotic uh, video or something? I mean, God was there. You know, the human, re the human um, there are psychosomatic reactions to things that go on between our soul and our body, you know, that we, we react to. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, it's a, govern it's a, it's a um, viable indication that something's of God or not, just because you got a goosebump. Amen. Oh, I was going to, I, I lifted up my hand to prophesy. Ooh, I felt the glory. I prophesied and felt as dry as kindling. No, didn't feel, didn't feel a thing, but I know the Holy Ghost. See, you can, you can minister without feeling. Now, thank God when you do have feeling, but you know what? You've got to learn to distinguish between feeling and the voice of God and understanding God. That's why you've got to become spirit conscious. Where he, where he communes with you and communicates with you in your inner man so that you're not moved by uh, some physical thing to indicate to you whether or not it's, it, God's involved. That, that's, and really, that's, that's a real big sign of immaturity when you do because you're allowing feelings or flutters or goosebumps or as the, 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 geese, the goose in um, Balto says, people bumps. All right? Yeah, I got people bumps. Well, goose, goose can't, I get geese can't get peak goosebumps. All right. So know that God wants to commune with you in your spirit and not let physical things determine whether or not it's God or not. Because then, then what will happen is um, <clears throat> you'll have people who, who are a little flaky, squirrely, have a little flutter. Oh, that's the Holy Ghost. And they begin to prophesy things that aren't even in Bible, aren't even in the Bible. You can put all the, thus saith the Lord's and the word of the Lord's have come unto me saying, and, and I hear the spirit of the, I hear the voice of God speaking I, all you want to, but if it's not biblical, it ain't God. Amen. And I've seen too much of it. And I believe in the manifestation of the spirit. I proc, I, 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 I flow and I manifest, and, and, and God manifests through me gifts of the spirit on a regular basis. I know that. I know the Holy Ghost. But it has, we have to learn to be spirit conscious so we're understanding that it's God and not some emotion or whim or thought that we had that we just want to put uh, God's, you know, 
use God as a leverage to um, validate ourselves for our faults, whatever. Anyway. Was a hallelujah. Okay. Now listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Amplified says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prays. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. So, <clears throat> it's, real it's real interesting here. Now, the Amplifier calls the understanding of the mind and also says when we pray I, with our spirit, that our spirit, by the Holy Spirit within us, prays. So, the understanding is a natural human mentality. It's of the soul. Now, you can pray out of your soul. You can pray things you're thinking. You can, th you can pray out desires out of, your, out of the will that you have in your, in your mind. And the things you, and you can pray out those things. Hallelujah. But when we pray in the Spirit, we're praying out of our, we're not praying fervently. Some people say, oh, praying in the Spirit is praying fervently. No, praying in the Spirit is praying in other tongues. Why? Because Paul said it was. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. So Paul said it was. Well, I don't believe it. I believe Paul. I don't care what you say. I disagree with you because you don't believe the Bible. Amen. And if you're not going to believe the Bible, we don't have a whole lot to talk about as Christians. If you're just going to come up with what you think and what you, you discern or what you feel or what some the theological cemetery told you, I didn't say it by mistake. I said cemetery. And it takes the life out of you and points you away from the Word of God and points you to man's doctrines. Uh, it's, it's cemetery. It'll kill, you. It'll kill your ability to function and flow with God. And look what Jesus said in John 7, 37 through 39. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, in another place, Jesus says this, he said, talking about the new birth, it's a well of life. It's a well springing up unto everlasting life. And think about that. The new birth was referred to as a well springing up unto eternal or everlasting life within the believer. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost is referred to a river flowing out of you. Why? You're to drink of one and let others drink of the other. You're the drink of the well of life from the new birth but you're to be having rivers flow out of you that are, that are rivers of life to lost and hurting people because you are, you're, you're able to minister by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're not, we're not, we're not, trying, we, we're not trying to have cunningly devised fables. Amen. Amen. I like what Paul said. Paul said, I came not with you, not unto you, with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest or stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. I believe 1 Corinthians 2.14. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Nope. I was wrong. Just, don't you just love it when you get it wrong? No, I don't. <laughs> it's in the Bible. You can find it on the concordance. Hallelujah. Yeah, somehow find it. Hallelujah. So understand that the, the, the flow of the Holy Ghost out of you is to be able to minister to other people. Now, we've talked about the fact that the man gets born again, his spirit gets saved, but your soul and your body don't get changed. Now, let me say this. You can renew your mind on the earth, but your body has a promissory note. You cannot get an eternal, glorified, un uh, uncorruptible, or incorruptible, immortal body until, until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That being said, if you live longer than before the rapture comes, you will die physically. It might, if you lived 100, 125, praise God. Amen? But I'm telling you, if Jesus doesn't come back before you get to 100, 125, and you go home and be with the Lord, you're physically going to die. I remember when Dad Hagen died, these, these evil, quote, Christians, posted stuff on the Internet. My, oh, my, Kenneth Hagin didn't have enough faith. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, and you know, at that time, you're thinking, Lord, is there any way that we could kind of speed up this technology thing so I can reach through the internet and choke them and do a bam bam on them? You know, you know, he could keep, well, you know what? His faith kept him alive seven years longer than doctors said he would have been. Amen. Also, he always said he would, he would, he would, uh, if you lived to your 87th year, you were doing good. And if you go back and listen to Dad Hagen, he would, he would say this. When he turned 80, he, I mean, when he turned 79, he'd, he'd say, I'm in my 80th year of life. Because he had lived fully 79. So he had just turned 86, so he was in his 87th year of life. And that's how he always talked about it. Over, you hear him talking on, on tapes and series. He'd be talking about, well, I'm in my 78th year of life. He was 77, but he thought, he, he counted as, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 78th year. And he was accurate. See, when I turn, I, now I'm in my 55th year of life. Now I will turn 55 in August, but I'm in my 55th year. I've lived 54 complete years, but I'm living in my 55th year. Now it hasn't finished, reached this point. So he always said that, you know, if you lived, to, you lived until your 87th year, you've done good or whatever. And, that's, and, he, and he used to say privately, the best way to die is to get up, have your favorite breakfast, have your favorite dessert, and go home. Now it's precisely what he did. Uh, Doc and Jerry Horton were at the house, and, uh, and, and, they, had cooked, and she had cooked, she, they had cooked breakfast. I guess her and Miss Aretha had cooked breakfast. And, uh, and then she cooked his, made his favorite dessert, which was strawberries and cream, some kind of strawberries and cream dessert. He ate the breakfast, ate the, ate the strawberries and cream, looked at Sister Aretha, dropped his head. Now, the, the rescue squad came, and if it hadn't been Raymond students or Raymond graduates on the, on the team, he'd, he'd have been dead at the scene. They, they worked on him for over half an hour to get some kind of heartbeat back, put him in the hospital and stuff. But, I mean, after three or four days or whatever it was, they never, they, he never came back because he was gone that minute. If you can die according to what you declare, you can live your life and go home exactly how you said you want to go home, that's faith. Now, you little pinheads out there who say he didn't have enough faith to live, why don't you just, just go blow your nose and, and, and zip your lip, put crazy glue across your lips. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're just full of evil and hate because you don't agree with his doctrine. That's just hate-filled speech. Amen. Amen. And I do want to lay hands on you. <laughs> I'm messing now. <laughs> like hard, fast, and continuously. You know, lay hands on those men suddenly. Oh, I would love to lay them on you, buddy. All right. <clears throat> I'm just messing now. Now, so the spirit of man is the part that gets born again. When you get born again, you, get, you become a new creature. But your soul has to be renewed and restored. Listen to James chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. What's that got to do with being led by the Spirit? You have, to you have to learn to distinguish between the Spirit and the soul and renew your mind, restore the soul, so that it works in cooperation with your Spirit instead of contrary to it. You, you, got, un you got thoughts of unbelief working in your soul, and the Spirit of God is trying to lead you in your Spirit. It's working contrary to you. And you've got, you've got to get that thing... Uh, renewed and restored so that it's working in harmony with your spirit instead of working against you. Um, you, can, you can have faith in your heart and doubt in your head and it still works, but it's a whole lot tougher. Okay? Now, James chapter 1, 18 through 21. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart, apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now notice here, sometimes I just get honor and I can't let it go, or I don't want to, because stuff, people are saying stuff that's messing people up. Notice he didn't say here, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, lay down and look at the finished work of Jesus, and it's all going to be okay. He said, brethren, didn't he? Who's he talking to? The church. He, what did he say, dude? Let, er, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to the wrath, for the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart. You've got a responsibility 
to do something. Lay apart filthiness. Lay apart superfluity of naughtiness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now, see, you'll get people coming, he's talking about getting saved. No, he's not. He said, save your suke, not your pneuma. And so the word sozo here, now the word sozo is used in reference to saving of the human spirit, but it's not limited to that. If you'll do a study on the, on the sozo word group, you'll find out the meaning is vastly broader than being born again. That is the, the main thing that happens to us is get the born again. But sozo comes from the primary, um, it comes from a primary contra contraction from an obsolete word of so as, uh, seos, meaning safe. But it, it, so it's been, it's been modified, and that's how it happened with words. They modified over time. It means to save. It also means to deliver or protect, literally or figuratively. And it's translated heal, preserve, save, do well, be made whole. Okay? In the New Testament, the soul of man is renewed or restored. Now, any confusion about, you know, the soul and the spirit being the same comes primarily from, from Old Testament, where oftentimes the terms for soul and spirit are used interchangeably, but that is not so in the New Testament, where clear distinctions between the soul of man and the spirit of man are made. When we refer to in the New Testament of the man's spirit, it's born again. You become a new creature in the spirit but the soul is renewed. Amen? Romans 12, 1. I'm sorry, Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed, fashioned, shaped, molded, according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So another, now again, transformed is metamorpho. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that the renewing of the mind enables you to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Why? Because now your thought processes are in line with understanding who God is, and when your spirit's wanting to be led by the Holy Ghost, your mind's not resisting, going, I don't know if that's God or not. When you've renewed your mind, you know, well, that's, that's, that's got to be the Holy Ghost, because the Bible says... Your mind's cooperating, your soul's cooperating with the, the Spirit and not working against it. Amen? Now, I am going to give a very difficult attempt at pronouncing the word that we, we've translated renewing. Uh, anakinosis. 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 Okay? I'm anakinosis. Woo! Anakinosis. Praise the Lord. And it means renovation. Let there be a renovation of your mind. Renewing King James. Renovation. Now, when you renovate something, what do you typically do? Come on, somebody. Think, baby. Louder. It, you, you, you're, you're whispering back there. If you renovate a room, what do you do? You gut it. You gut it. If you're going to renovate... Putting new paint on it is not renovating. That's just freshening it up. When you renovate, if, you, if you're going to renovate your kitchen, forget, every, I mean, the, kitchen, the cabinets are coming out, the plumbing's coming out, they're going down to the subfloor, and you're building it back up. You're renovating. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world. Don't be fashioned, shaped, or molded, but be metamorphosed by the renovating of your mind. Hallelujah. The mind has to be renovated. It's been taught from the time you were born. And now our public schools and our education facilities are trying to indoctrinate every, our children and our teens and our college-age students with the gunk and the bunk of the world. And, you, you know, when you get somebody saved, you've got to renovate their thinking because they all believe that, you know, the theory of evolution is real. Yet scientifically, it is still the theory of evolution. You could just as legitimately teach the theory of creation in the schools. Yes, it does. Psalm 23, 3 says, it's, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Did you know that nowhere in the world 
<clears throat> does it say that God restores or renews our spirit? I'll take out that old stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. Amen. When you're born again, old things pass away, all things become new. Amen. So our spirits are born again. Our souls are renewed. Amen. Kenneth Hagin said this uh, years ago. He said, when our minds get renewed with the word of God, then listen, we think in line with God's word, with what God's word says. We are able to know and prove the will of God. We don't have so many questions about the will of God when we get our souls saved or renewed or made whole or restored. So, so. the greatest, listen to this, at the time he said this, and I don't think things have changed. As a matter of fact, I think it may be more prevalent today than ever before. The greatest need of the church today is minds renewed with the word of God. Minds renewed with the word of God. Why? Because if we cannot prove what is the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God, we're going to be confused. Or we're going to be led by feelings. Or we're going to be led by a goosebump. Or somebody's going to, you know, the preacher was real emotional and emphatic, and therefore it had to be God. I, I'll tell you what. When I was in Thailand a number of years ago, I turned the TV on, and there was a Muslim preaching. He preached with all the fervor and whatever of any Christian preacher I've ever heard. But he's preaching false. He's preaching a lie, not preaching the truth. So just because you can get emotionally stirred don't mean it's God. Now, and I believe in preaching. I believe, you know, Jesus went about teaching and preaching. <coughs> I believe preaching is just as viable part of ministry. Some people get, you know, get off on the teaching side, and they, and they, they kind of slam preachers. I think both are necessity. Preaching brings inspiration. Teaching brings revelation. Amen. We need both. You need to have inspiration to your revelation, and you need to have revelation to govern your inspiration. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so the second part of being led by the, of, of getting positioned to being led by the Spirit of God, and one way is that we understand that the Spirit of man is the count of the Lord. That is searching all the inner heart parts of the belly, the man's spirit gets born again. Secondly, the mind of man must be renewed to be able to prove the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. The suki of God is renewed. Thirdly, we present our bodies. In other words, you got to keep the rascal under. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to, unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the word reasonable in the King James is translated in other translations, and really when you look at it in the Greek, is which is your spiritual service. Our spirit's service is to keep our body presented to God as a, as a, living, as a living sacrifice. I know we said some of these things the other day. Think about the fact you've got to keep your body and just basically say, it's alive, but it's a sacrifice. Constantly. Amen? Um, we do not die to self. It's an old Pentecostal saying, just got to die to self. And that's not a biblical term. Now, there's terms that says, put off the old man and put on the new. Amen. Paul says, I, you know, but I keep under. Now, the Amplified says Buffett. Now, I've been quoting a lot, Buffett, my body. But, you know, the King James doesn't use that term, but the Amplified says, but I keep under or I buffet my body and bring it into subjection. <clears throat> Lest that by any means when I preach to others, I should be a castaway. Paul's saying that if I don't control and govern my flesh, I can become a castaway. Now, boy, that, that smacks straight into the face of much of what's being taught by people or shared by people. Now, maybe not the main preachers, but by people who are listening to them. It smacks straight into the face of a lot of what people say about grace. It doesn't matter what I do. Paul said that if I don't buffet my body and keep it in subjection, even when I preach to others, I could be a castaway. Right there, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. That's pretty strong. Thank you, and glad you're enthused by it. Could you get a little more enthused? Thank you, Gina is enthused. All right, so now let me say something. <clears throat> we are born again in our spirits, we renew our minds, and we have to keep our body under. Now, here's, now see, when I was Pentecostal, we used to believe, and, and, well, I was, I'm still Pentecostal. 
But I grew up in, a, in what was referred to as a classical Pentecostal denomination, one of the major Pentecostal denominations. And we would, you know, we, we would go to the altar and pray. After you got saved, you had to get sanctified because it was part of our testimony. I want to thank the Lord, hallelujah, that I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so we'd get born again. But then we would spend weeks, months, years waiting until we got sanctified. How did you know when you got sanctified? You wouldn't have those desires anymore. We didn't understand that your flesh is going to want to do stuff. And you can't sanctify it so that it don't. Hello? One, one woman asked Brother Hagin one time, said, I want you to pray for me. He said, what for? He said, that I won't have any tr more trouble with my flesh. He said, well, you want me to pray that you die? Because as long as you're in this body, you're going to have trouble with it. I don't believe that. My confession is I have no trouble with my flesh. Go ahead, dummy. Hello? you got to follow a scriptural principle. You can't just confess, I'm not going to have any, I don't have any trouble with my flesh. You're lying like a dog, a hound dog, a blood hound on a hot summer afternoon on the front porch. Hello? I mean, I'm telling you right now. <clears throat> you're going to have trouble with your flesh. Hello? Paul said I had to buffet my body and bring into subjection. Had to keep it under. Had to keep it under. Now, let me say this. Just because your body wants to do something wrong doesn't mean you're not saved. If that were so, Paul wouldn't be saved because he said he had to keep it under. Amen? It is a ongoing battle you're going to have with your body to keep it a living sacrifice to buffet it and to keep it under control it don't Romans 6 do not yield your members as servants of unrighteousness why would he have to write that because your, your your members want to be they want to be servants of unrighteousness but yield them as servants of the righteousness unto God amen you got to deal with that flesh you got to deal with that flesh like when you hear they, they, they say bad things about Dad Hagen. You want to go through and choke them. And I did, but I had to deal with my flesh. So when you just said, well, I was talking about how, how people do stuff. Um, it, stirs up, it stirs up emotion. You got to put it down. There are people who stir up emotion. I've seen Christians walk in a room because a different Christian walked in the room. They got mad about blew a gasket out their blood pressure because they couldn't be in the same room with them. Well, you hadn't, sub you hadn't brought your flesh into subjection. Hello, you haven't buffeted your body. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you, Gina. Hallelujah. So just because your body wants to do it doesn't mean you're living in sin. It's what you do with it. Do you bring in this objection? Do you tell it no? Do you refuse to yield to that and say, no, I, I, I will not yield to that. I'm a, I'm a child of God. I'm born of the Spirit of God. And body, I command you to come in subjection right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not follow that appetite and that desire. You will obey and do what the will of God is. And I offer you right now a living sacrifice before God to do His will and to be a, yielded to the will and the purpose of God. You may have to do that 25 times a day. And the more you do, or more. There are days it could be more than that. There are days it could be others. Less than that. How, how do you know? When you sleep 18 hours, it's hard for your flesh to do it. So if you sleep a long time, there you go. And so sleep is not the answer that you got to get up and do stuff. All right. So now, look, you've got the, you've got the Zoe, the uh, life or the Zoe nature, the nature of God, the life and nature of God in you. Let that man dominate you. How do I do that? And we're going, next week we're going to get into some more of this. We're going to get into part two. There's, uh, there are three parts to this message. You start learning to listen to the inner man. You become clear about what you're hearing in the inner man by renewing your mind to the word. And let me say this. you got to keep your flesh under. It's hard to hear from heaven when you're indulging in fleshly appetites. It's just hard. I didn't say it's impossible. I said it's hard. Amen. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I get amazed. Listen, I've never ceased to find amazement in how many people hear from God 
when they're at their most fleshly state. And it's always, like in church relationships, lead the church. The pastor's not hearing from God. The pastor's not giving me what I need. The pastor's not doing what I want. The pastor this. And they're at their most carnal state. But yet they'll come to you, the Lord showed them. The Lord showed me. And, I, you know, I'm not going to be totally 100%, you know, where I can't say God couldn't talk to you, but 99.99% of the time, hogwash. You're so carnal, you wouldn't know the whole voice of the Holy Ghost if he came in and hit you upside the head with a baseball bat. That's why you got to keep your flesh under and keep your mind renewed. Now, here's the thing. Very few times in my years of being in the ministry, associate pastor and pastoring, which now I'm in my 32nd year, actually going to my 33rd year of ministry. Okay? Uh, this, April, this May will be my 32nd year of, of being ordained into the ministry. So I'm in you know, 32 years of ministry. Have I seen people walk into a, to a pastor's office where everything is good? They're, they're, they're in tune with God. There's no, there's no conflict going on in their life. And they're saying, Pastor, God, God wants me to leave and go, go do this. Go, go move here and do this. The only time I've ever seen it happen when somebody has a call of God on their life. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying that the track record that I have seen in 32 years of ministry is this. Well, we're supposed to go to Bible school. Well, then, then you know, praise the Lord. Is it the right time? Amen? Amen? If, if stepping out into, you know, stepping out into a calling, but just to jump ship and run to another church in town, all I've ever seen, because, you know, like Benny just left us, that now he'd been praying about that and talking about that for, for years, almost a decade. And he came and said, think believe it's the right time. And I, I, it seemed good to me, so we, we just laid hands on him and sent him out. He wasn't mad with us, wasn't upset, wasn't being carnal, wasn't living in the flesh, wasn't carousing the bars, and then got a revelation he's supposed to leave. Hello? But I can tell you time after time after time after time after time after time, people have come when they're in a, they're in, they're, they're in a stagnant place with God where they become more carnal. They become more given to their fleshly appetites. And this, sometimes fleshly appetites don't, don't necessarily mean you're out having sex or getting drunk. You're just indulging in your own whims or your own desires versus what God wants. You got your own want to's. You, you can have a want to that's contrary to what God wants. You can want to be the big dog of a ministry and God wants you to be a subordinate ministry. You, pr you pressure that desire for what you want and you'll end up with it, but you'll, you'll be, that's fleshly. It was fleshly. You kept yielding to your fleshly desires of your own personal whatevers and you got them. So, you got to keep your flesh under. But, I, but <clears throat> in, in fulfilling, f following this up, I've, pe people get into places where they're angry or mad or bitter or resentful about things. And, and in the middle of that, they'll hear from heaven. They're supposed to move. Go somewhere else. Do something else. Now, I used to try to talk them out of it. I don't anymore. You walk in my office and say, God told me, thank you. Go on. Be blessed. And I mean, why? Because you told me God told you. Amen. And like, why not? Well, the Lord told you, I guess, you know. You know, you just got to find out the hard way whether it was God or not. Because I'm not going to sit here and try to argue and talk you out of it. Because you didn't come to get my counsel. You came to inform me you heard from heaven. When you do that. I've heard from heaven. No, they didn't say that. They said, God told me. God showed me. And you know what's going on in their life. You know the junk that's going on in their life. You know the stuff that's going on with, with, with their heart. You're, you're the pastor. You know stuff. No room to say anything. God, what? God told them. You've got to keep your flesh under. And you keep your mind renewed to the Word of God. So that you can really understand what's really going on in your spirit. I'm going to tell you something. If your mind's not renewed and your flesh is not kept under, you won't know if it's the voice of God, the voice of your flesh. You just won't know. And the devil will feed you thoughts. And call you my son, my daughter. Amen. Amen.